Good afternoon, good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, this is a fantastic turnout, something that just uh, warms my heart. Uh, as, as an engineer by training, um, the, the title I'm most proud of, unfortunately, uh, no one ever made me a professor, but uh, is engineer. To this day, when I fill out a mortgage application, when I fill out uh, uh, my passport form and it asks me for my occupation, I put engineer. Uh, I, I don't do very much engineering these days anymore, and I try to, as my colleague Mary, who's in the audience, would, uh, uh, would uh, confirm for you, I try to get involved as much as they'll let me uh, in the engineering that goes on within our company, but um, the, the business of technology, and thank you, Dean, for mentioning that uh, eventually you will need to sell something. That's an important thing that nobody told me as an engineering undergraduate student, but I learned, uh, learned by fire. Um, engineering and, and the application of science to solve hard problems is, is my passion. So when I, when I go through this talk, I'm going to eventually get around to what makes you passionate and what should drive you uh, as you enter into your career. So um, just by way of, um, of an agenda, I'm going to split this talk into two. I'm going to go relatively quickly. It's warm in here. I realize I'm standing between you and the awards and then eventually dinner. So I know my place, I know, I know where, where I am in your hearts. Uh, nobody showed up today to hear a keynote speech, but, but you're here anyway, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna divide this talk into two pieces. One, the way I define innovation. And secondly, the, the second part of the talk about managing innovation. And this, these are two things that became clear to me over my studies and my career not so much uh, present in the, in the actual coursework that I went through in my undergraduate studies. It became more obvious in grad school, and for those of you who are not in grad school yet and considering it, I highly recommend it. It was uh, the only time in my engineering uh, curriculum where I was able to just do engineering and not be bothered with uh, the history of the Hollywood cinema and mountain biking and all of the things that I do anyway. I just don't need a grade for. I want to take the engineering classes. So the, the concentration that's afforded to you in, in grad school is, uh, is a, a very key part of your education and your growth uh, as an engineer or as a sci scientist. And, and for those of you considering it, I highly recommend it. So in terms of um, uh, enabling innovation and the managing of innovation is going to be the second part of the talk. I want to start with, um, uh, with an example by uh, someone who is very much not a former colleague of mine, but uh, Claude Shannon, who's a very famous scientist and professor at, at uh, MIT, and uh, eventually uh, made his way to um, um, uh, Bell Laboratories and to uh, doing an awful lot of research in information theory. And the, the idea that uh, uh, Shannon uh, posited was that all information is a surprise. What you see in the other room in terms of innovation is a surprise. A surprise meaning it's something I, know, I now know that I didn't know before I went on this quest, on this endeavor, before I started this project, before I started my work. Without information, nothing changes. And it's the same way that, for instance, uh, digital compression works in high-definition television. If the information doesn't change, I don't send the signal. I leave it on the screen. If the information changes, I, change, I send a new signal, and I only change those bits. And that's how I can transfer a tremendous amount of information using less bandwidth and thus making the channel more efficient. That's what Claude Shannon focused on, was, was conveying information. And he defines the conveyance of information uh, using a, a theorem which eventually we all called the Shannon limit. It's the limit between what information is conveyed, it's the, it's the difference between what information is conveyed and the total bandwidth allowed to convey it. And I'm going to bring this back to engineering and how this applies. This is not meant to be a lecture. Um, what Claude Shannon focused on was in order to convey information efficiently, I have to control noise because noise confuses the channel and I have to establish a channel, the bandwidth of that channel. So any, any channel has a specific bandwidth, whether it's in the optical domain, an RF domain, or whatever the, the medium is for conveyance, it has, a it has a bandwidth associated with it. There's always a certain amount of noise which takes away from my ability to communicate information. So Shannon focused on defining those, those parameters, and in particular, when you're conveying an idea, when you're doing a research project, when you're trying to improve the knowledge of humankind, you have to worry about that information being conveyed in a channel. Um, uh, Claude, did an awful, or, uh, yeah, Claude Shannon did an awful lot of work in this area, and eventually the application of what is now 
uh, uh, Boolean logic in, in modern computing systems and eventually uh, applied a lot of his work to cryptography and to code, code breaking in, uh, in World War II. Um, all, the, all the while looking at the conveyance of information, the relationship, and I'll tie this back to, uh, to engineering here in a moment. Uh, in terms of managing information, so when you look at yourself, you're managing a research project, you're managing a group of, of students, you're managing a research team, you're managing a company, you're managing a development project, you're managing anything that has to do with innovation and the conveyance of information. There are certain things, and I apologize for turning, I don't have slides in front of me here, but I want to make sure I'm, I'm uh, keeping you uh, consistent with the slides. Uh, to create an environment uh, for which information, uh, for conveyance of information that includes a culture that fosters innovative, innovative thought. You want to make sure that there is an environment where people don't feel pressure to not suggest new ideas, where people feel free to introduce their concepts uh, to a team, whether it's, again, on the research project, whether it's in, in the business environment. I'm going to try to pop this off of here so I can uh, not crane my neck. Hopefully that's okay. Sorry to the cameraman for moving around the stage. I'm, I'm, I'm half Italian. I should have started with that introduction, so I move around when I, when I talk. Uh, but having that culture where people feel free to convey ideas freely is extremely important. Secondly, a reward system that recognizes that. There's prizes associated with this. There's recognition. There's posters. There's people that come to see your work. This is an important step. This is not just in academia. This, ex this exists everywhere. Uh, DARPA, the Defense Research Agency, IARPA for the intelligence community, HSARPA for Homeland Security. These are all agencies we work with. They have contests continuously and they reward innovation either with funded research or with industry type of awards to recognize you. Same thing, uh, same corollary exists here in academia, but in it, wherever you are, whether you're in school, whether you're in an office environment, whether you're in a research lab, make sure that that exists, an opportunity to recognize those uh, who, who are capable of promoting their innovation. A fault tolerant system. You cannot innovate without failure. You have to be able to tolerate failure. And if you're in an environment, and I've been in some of these environments where funding is allocated for research, you have to obviously enter into it wisely, and I'm gonna get through a set of questions that are typically used to evaluate a research project, but understand that failure is a likely outcome in most research programs. And that's something that we recognize in our business and something that our customers, mostly the Defense Department and Health and Human Services, Homeland Security, recognize is part of research investment. People get impatient sometimes. They get impatient when writing policy, they get impatient when writing checks, and they want a solution. They want a six, a six month solution to a very complex, very difficult problem that exists somewhere in the world. It's very unlikely you're going to see much innovation in that six month period. What you're gonna see is a lot of failure and further frustration. So whatever you can do to advocate for a fault tolerant system will go a long way towards promoting continued investment and continued support of research. Diversity of thought. Diversity is a very popular word, it's a very PC word. Not exactly what I'm talking about. Diversity of thought means people that think differently. When we get a particularly hard challenging problem from our customers, from the federal government, and we don't have a very obvious solution to it, we pull together people and we form a brainstorming session. And one of the most uh, interesting solutions that I saw in, in one of these sessions was back in the early days of the Iraq war, IEDs were extremely popular by uh, the adversaries to make an impact. Uh, very low tech, very difficult to find, very effective uh, against allied troops. One of the challenges our government gave us was try to find these things. Try to find these things, as we say, left of the boom. Let's find it before it blows up. There's lots of interesting ways to do chemical trace detection, to use uh, laser spectroscopy, one of the ways that our, one of our engineers came up with in one of our brainstorming sessions was using acoustic energy. Energize the ground with acoustics and measure the return on that. Do it over time. Baseline the return of that acoustic energy over time and look for holes in the wave patterns as they come back. Very innovative way of, of, uh, innovative way of finding, basically, if somebody dug a hole or if the density of the earth changed in a specific area. This is diversity of thought. If we put all of our RF engineers in a room and said solve this problem, we would have got an RF solution. But we didn't. We took physicists, we took mathematicians, we took 
people from inter interdisciplinary areas and had them try to work on a solution. And that's a key, a key factor in innovation is diversity of thought. Creating a fair medium for conveyance. This is relating back to Claude Shannon. Make sure you have a channel. Make sure you have a means provided for everybody to convey their ideas. And specifically, Adam Smith. Who knows who Adam Smith is? Okay, lots of hands. I'm not going to call on you and make you prove that you know who Adam Smith is. The, uh, the, the father of, of modern economy talks about the integral parts of having an economy. And, and those are uh, free trade, the existence of free trade, meaning you can exchange ideas in the, way, in the area of innovation, the, the ability to exchange ideas freely. Reasonable regulations, you always need rules. You cannot operate in an area that without, uh, without any limits, without any rules. We have the laws of physics, these are things we have to obey. We have policy, we have rules of decency, other things that are, that are important in the areas of innovation to obey. Uh, a sound currency, it has to be worth something. As, as Dean Dolling said, you're, you're, you know, you're going to have to sell this someday. It's gotta be worth something to somebody. And that worth is measured in currency. It can be dollars, it can be uh, recognition, it can be advancement, it can be Bitcoin, whatever you determine is, and I'm not suggesting that's a sound currency. Um, <laughs> whatever, you, whatever you determine is a sound currency. Modest taxation, I think this was a gift Adam Smith gave to uh, uh, founding fathers and to others who have to create a system that can support itself with regulations and enforcement of regulations, you have to pay for it. So modest taxation, his point was, don't overtax the system. And same thing applies to, to innovation. And protection of intellectual property, absolutely key. It's key to the economy, it's key, and you'll see it in many, many laws throughout this country, throughout the world. But if you're ever in a position to protect somebody else's intellectual property, uh, you've been put in a very trusted position, you need to take that very seriously. Consider yourself and your own intellectual property, the intellectual property that's represented in, in the room next door, and what your advisors brought to you, what your professors convey to you, other people's ideas. Cherish them, treat them fairly, and protect them because they're important. It is the trade that all of you will use when vying for a job, when vying for research dollars, when vying for uh, promotion or uh, for uh, recognition in your industry. Uh, clearly defined set of rules and regulations, as I said, most importantly, in advance. Don't make up the rules as you go along. If you have rules for your research group, if you have rules for your company, they're called policies, limit them to the important things. Most things you'll find aren't that important. We can go rule crazy. We're good at that in this country. Keep it focused on the, 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 the most important aspects of your research, define the boundaries, and move on. Make sure they're clearly defined in advance. I talked about defending intellectual property. And then take an opportunity to showcase your talents, as each of you have elected to do. Not everybody does that. It's not easy. Sometimes it's hard. Um, in, in some small aspect, you're self-promoting. You're also promoting the idea of innovation and the idea of, of uh, advancements in technology. So take an opportunity to showcase your talents when you find that others have an opportunity, for those who aren't exhibiting here today but are here as guests, take an opportunity to attend. It's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful way to promote this. Lastly, if you ever find yourself in the business world, and I know in academia it exists the same, invest wisely, okay? Make sure there is some market application somewhere for this technology. I am fantastic, and I'm sure most of you are too, at coming up with new ideas. Most of them have no application in an economy, in a market. I couldn't sell them to anybody, not even to myself, but it's a really good idea. Um, make sure that there's a market. Make sure there's a, an area where you can make a trade for this, again, in, in something that means something to you, either currency or, or um, recognition, but make sure there's a market. And lastly, and probably most importantly, in industry, have the guts to pull the plug. We are wonderful at competing for research dollars. We have all of our research directors and all of the researchers in my company. I should have mentioned earlier, my company builds networks and does research. We do about half and half. So half of our funding is contracted research for the federal government. Those people compete for those funds in, um, in RFPs that are submitted to the government. They also compete for internal funds. We fund research internally and they compete for those dollars. And there's lots of things that don't get funded. Of those that get funded, you can't keep investing good money after bad if it's going nowhere. You have to have certain measure ends. You have to be able to know when you're successful. And when you're deviating from that curve, cut the funding. 
move on. There's something else that deserves that funding. So don't take it personally. If your project gets cut, it means you deviated from your success criteria and you need to get back on track or uh, you need to find a new path and a new, a new area to, uh, to invest in. Okay, Heilmar, I mentioned earlier, how do you know when you've got the right project? Um, Dr. Heilmar worked for RCA Labs, worked for DARPA, I think at the time it was called ARPA, uh, founded Bellcore, eventually took the company public into, uh, was bought by SAIC, ran their research portion of SAIC, says since retired and now sits on the, Acad the National Academy of Engineering and the Defense Science Board. He is referenced throughout our industry, uh, particularly by these eight questions, the Heilmar questions. And in particular in DARPA, in IARPA, in the research agencies within the government, they will, if you're seeking funding for your project, they will ask you to answer these eight questions. They're not, they're not always easy to answer. What's the problem and why is it a hard problem? You have to clearly define the problem. I'll use that, that IED example again. We knew what the problem was. We saw it on the news every day. Why is it hard? Well, they're, they're low tech and, and uh, there's, they're not easy to find. Obviously, they're buried underground. We don't have domain control over the area. There's lots of challenging things. How is it solved today? A good example of this is in World War II, uh, the early ad, uh, adoption of radar. Um, I hate to keep using defense examples, but it's the industry I'm in and the one I know the most. There's certainly more about engineering than, than just defense, but aircraft were being picked up on radar and uh, those who were launching sorties were concerned about, uh, about radar. The way you overcome that is you overwhelm them, you swarm them, just keep launching more bombers. They can't knock them all out of the air. Keep launching bombers, keep launching. That was the way around it. All the while, they were working on a way to make an airplane invisible. Let's try to find a way so that the radar doesn't pick it up. Such was born stealth technology, and it took many decades of investment to get there, but eventually they did it. They found a way to make an airplane not appear on a radar signature. So that's, that's the, how it's solved today versus what you're going to do to solve the problem. Uh, what's the new technology? Why are we going to succeed? What's the impact if we're successful? In other words, does it solve the problem? Does it partially solve the problem? Does it solve another problem? What's the impact? Um, how are you going to organize your program? This is the same things when you went about your research. Uh, your advisors are asking you, how are you going to organize your work? How are you going to determine uh, your measures of success? How are you going to know you're making progress? This is extremely important. It's a step that most people forget to do. And it's what causes you to throw good effort and good money after bad. If you don't define your criteria, your milestones along the way, you can lose track and find yourself deep, deep, deep in a hole that you don't want to be in. Uh, now you're chasing your idea because you've all of your sunk cost. And for those of you who have taken accounting, you'll know what that means. Um, and then finally, the cost, the total cost of the program. That's obviously um, how some people view research. They, they say, uh, I want to do this project. Great. How much does it cost? And they skip the first seven questions about solving a hard problem. But it's, a, it's pretty important that you get to um, get through all eight of those before you make a determination. So in of information being innovation, information being something that's new, how do you, uh, you know, what's the physics behind this? I, I call this the, uh, the physics of innovation. How do you enable it in your group? in school, in work, and I like to take a couple of theorems. Um, I was, as, I, as mentioned, I was, I'm an electrical engineer, master's in systems engineering, but most of my passion, frankly, was in aerospace and physics in particular. And uh, my early parts of my career, I was able to work on spacecraft, designing comm payload packages for spacecraft. So I got the healthy mix of both the double E, the signal processing, and the aeronautics all in one. Work equals force times distance, the, the work kinetic uh, energy theorem. Simple, simple formula, we've all used it. If I want to um, maximize work, I have to focus on this, and I'll build out the slide here. Um, I have to focus on these two variables within the, within the equation. No matter how much force you exist, if you're not covering any distance, technically you're not doing any work. This applies to almost everything you do. Just because it's hard doesn't mean you're getting something done. Just because it took a lot of hours doesn't mean you're actually producing work. You have to cover distance. You have to accomplish something. And that brings you back to those Heilmar questions, establishing your success criteria along the way. Likewise, if you didn't invest yourself, if you didn't have to spend time on this, if you didn't have to exert a lot of effort, and yet you covered an awful lot of distance, you're probably not doing a lot of work in that, in that instance either. And so that gets, 
to my last, uh, um, one of my uh, points on my last slide about taking integrity in your work, making sure you accurately represent what you brought to the table when you do this work. Newton's second law, Isaac Newton, 1687, another one I like, force equals mass times acceleration, one of the first ones that we learn. Uh, when we look at this in the business sense, we try to solve for acceleration. Acceleration is the rate at which we innovate. It's how we innovate, it's, it's the speed at which innovation comes to market. So if I solve for acceleration, I have the, the numerator of force and the denominator of mass. So I have to manage those. I have to manage those on a research project. I have to manage those in a company. So if we decrease our mass we can, and deliver the same force, obviously we can increase acceleration. And likewise, if I have to keep my mass the same, uh, then obviously I have to increase my force in order to increase my, my acceleration. What do I mean by mass and force? In the business world, the mass is the infrastructure. It's what I carry around with me. It's my cost. It's my salaries. It's my IT system. It's the cost of all my buildings. It's everything that, that makes uh, up LGS in my case, and, and that has to be brought with me. If I can't reduce that, and I may not want to reduce that, I may need every asset I have there. The only option I have is to produce more force in order to increase acceleration, to increase the rate of innovation. And I won't walk you through the, the, cor the uh, inverse corollary there because it tends to be less friendly. This is when companies start laying people off. This is when they start cutting research funding. This is when they start making changes that threaten research, but it's the only way they can eke out an improvement in acceleration or innovation by reducing their mass. Ohm's law. Uh, I love this one. So um, I'll, I'll have you focus on, you know, V equals IR, the potential equals the current times the resistance. Sorry, I have a lot of double E ones here for those non-double E. But currency. Currency, again, is the rate at which an individual innovates. It's the rate of electron flow, the rate of, of proton flow. This is the rate at which innovation occurs. The potential of a person is relatively static over time. You can increase someone's by ten potential by adding knowledge, by training them, by investing in them, but frankly, their mental capacity is something they were born with. And you can add information to them, you can make them more powerful, but there's not a lot that you can do uh, through dollars, through investment, outside of adding information, what you're doing right now through education, to increase someone's potential. Companies like mine look for people like you, the shining stars, the cream of the crop, and we handpick every single person that we put in our company because we want the best of the best. We're going for high potential day one. We never go into a hiring situation saying, I can fix it. So it's really important that you represent yourself as that high potential individual day one. What I can control is resistance. I can remove barriers, as we say. I want to first take the boulders out of the road, and then I need to take the rocks out of your shoes. I need to make life easier. I need to reduce policies where appropriate. I need to increase funding to make it less, less burdensome on the research team. But that's reducing resistance, focusing on increasing currency, in this, in this case, the rate of innovation. So here's the last one, and um, I, I must confess, the, um, the lowest grade in my undergraduate class was in, um, uh, it was in a, uh, a physics class where uh, we spent an awful lot of time <laughs> um, talking about relativity. And uh, it was an area that I spent the most time reading about after my undergraduate. It was extremely difficult for me to work my way through this particular physics class, but it all became clearer later to me. And I want to sh share with you an example. Hard to see on this slide. You're in the middle of the chart. Uh, a light emitting object, this was one of Einstein's theories, uh, is emitting photon energy uh, on the right side of that graph. And of course, the, one of the theories associated with relativity is the, is the association between density and gravity. An immensely dense object, a planet in the solar system has the ability to bend light, has the ability to bend energy as it moves by it, the gravitational effects on energy. The same thing happens with people. Okay, if you want to build support for your program, you need to build your specific gravity. You need to increase your density. And again, that's partly what you're doing here. You're adding to your own capacity. You're adding to your own value by investing in yourself, spending the time to acquire knowledge, seek out those professors who add to your density, which over time will increase your specific gravity. And when it comes time to compete for those research dollars, when it comes time to compete for the for the program uh, within your company, within a customer shop, 
you need to win over those fence sitters. It's not unlike any other idea that you want to champion. There's going to be the majority of the people that are on the fence day one, and you need to win them over, and that happens with gravity. Here's an example of some individuals with high density or high gravity. They're not all good, right? There's some good and there's some not so good on this chart. Um, depending on, on, your, uh, on your view, all right, I've got a room full of engineers. Who's on the bottom right? Tim Tebow, all right. Didn't take too long. Um, these people changed the course of history. They, they championed ideas, good or bad. They had a capacity within them to convince people to support their ideas. Again, good or bad, virtue aside, these people had a very high density and, there, and therefore a very high specific gravity. So if you look at them, whether you admire what they did or not, you have to admire how influential they were. So when you get to my last slide, how do you increase your density? How do you increase your specific gravity? And these are just some, some rules that I like to follow myself, that I like to convey to others, particularly in coaching type situations. Establish your essential el elements. This is e effectively how the universe is formed, right? Figure out what makes you up. I suggest you look at some obvious ones, honesty, integrity, reliability, predictability. Decide what your core values are, embrace them, and make sure they are reflected in everything that you do. Find your passion. You mentioned two previous speakers talk about passion. I'm talking about passion. Find out what you're passionate about. Don't fake it, okay? This is extremely important. You will, you will subject yourself to compromise if people think that you are faking interest in an idea, in a topic. Um, work on things that you're absolutely passionate about. Champion things that you're abs absolutely passionate about. Don't, don't fall victim to somebody else's bad idea. Uh, think for yourself. Be an independent thinker. Uh, and make sure that you stay honest to your own integrity. Um, I talked about predictability earlier. Um, Finding, uh, as I talked about before, finding people with like minds to form a core group is important in research. Finding those fence sitters who are looking for an important project to invest in, don't quite know what they're looking for yet, try to sway them your way. This is something that we talked about before in terms of, in terms of gravity. Practice, practice, practice. Those of you who are presenting today, I only saw about a third of the presentations on the floor, exceptionally well done, very well spoken, very knowledgeable of your topic areas. I asked some questions of you, very quick with answers. All of this is a way of conveying your confidence, your knowledge, and the density you have in your head, your assets that you bring to the table. And eventually, your job, if you want to continue research, is to convince somebody to part with money to fund your research so that you can further innovation and you can you can get to that ideal state in, in the technology the area that you're, specific, that you're working on specifically. When managing people, this goes, it doesn't matter if you're running a company or a research group or what you are, reward the good. I say ignore the bad. There are certain things that obviously can't be ignored. But in terms of good, you're all smart people. You all got here. You all got into GW. You all got into C's. You all made it to this far. You're surrounded by smart people. When you go to work, you're going to be handpicked. You're going to be placed in an organization that's filled with smart people. Okay, the, one of the fortunate things that, that we have in our profession, that we have in our industry, is there's not a lot of people who don't have similar mental capacities. Therefore, if they screwed up, they probably know it. You don't have to point it out. You don't have to dwell. You don't have to make them feel bad. Part of your job is to coach them up, reward the good, say this was exceptionally well. I liked last time when you did this. This worked well reward the good, and in my opinion, ignore as much of the bad as you can. Um, we talked about rewarding people, recognizing them for their work earlier. That's part of this. Lastly, establish the rules and enforce them. We can go policy crazy. We can go rule crazy. My philosophy is find the minimal set of rules that you need. Leave as many things unbounded as possible, and you're going to see good things happen. You can, you can policy, you can rule, you can litigate yourself right into a hole where no innovation occurs. There's examples of this all over the world. We fight it internally here within our own legislation, but frankly, universities are one of the best places where you see examples of free thinking, limitless thinking, areas where they're encouraging free thought and trying to put as few rules as possible while you can, while you can foster uh, you know, young, impressionable and, and innovative thinking, 
uh, before they get to the workplace and we start to clamp down on everybody and establish all kinds of rules and tell you how to dress and what time you have to be at work and everything else. So um, those are my postulate, my rules for uh, how to increase your specific gravity, how to increase your density and eventually uh, gain support for your research. So hopefully you see the tie between the physics of people, the physics of philosophy, and the ideas of innovation and information tying together throughout this. And I won't bore you with any more uh, at that point. Thank you for your attention.